Hello everyone and welcome to the second session of our virtual SPM user meeting. My name is Magdalena Marszałek and I work in the marketing and sales team at Zurich Instruments and I will be your host this afternoon. Some of you have already participated in our morning session, but we have some new attendees as well, to whom I extend a very warm welcome. It is great that you are all with us. Why this virtual event is taking place? We were supposed to be now in beautiful Lyon sharing knowledge on scanning probe microscopy with talks and posters and sharing bites and wines from local Bouchon. But due to the current unusual situation, we certainly cannot do the latter. However, nothing stops us from spreading the science. User meeting team at Zurich Instruments prepared this great webinar for you so that the SPM community can stay connected. We will meet in Lyon next year and I hope to see you all there. Now, let me go through this afternoon's program. In the first part of the session, you will be listening to Valentin Aubrier, who is doing his PhD at ST Microelectronics and Cialetti Grenoble. Valentin will introduce us to the impact of defects in silicon oxide interfaces and will tell us how Kelvin probe force microscopy can help to characterize these interfaces and spot their defects. The second part of the session will feature a tutorial by our application scientist, Mehdi Alem, who will focus on instrumentation challenges, especially the ones related to time-resolved SPM. Before I hand over to Valentin, please let me tell you how our Q&A session will work. So I would like to ask you to provide your questions through the Ask a Question tab at the bottom of your Zoom window at any time. After the talk, we will spend some time on answering them and I will address your questions to our expert who will provide the answers. You may have already noticed that your cameras are off and microphones are muted. That's why, that's because we want to give our full attention to speakers. If there isn't enough time to answer all your questions, Worry not, we will provide all of you with the list of questions and of course the answers in the email that you will receive within 10 days after the meeting. This email will include the recording of the session as well. And now I would like to welcome, welcome Valentin Aubrier. Hi Valentin, are you ready? We are looking forward to hear your talk, photosensitive Kelvin probe force microscopy for embedded silicon oxide interface characterization. Valentin, the floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon to everyone. And so my name is Valentin Aubrier and I am a second year PhD student at ST Microelectronics. And so today uh, I will talk about uh, the development of advanced atomic force microscopy for uh, photosensitive applications. So basically uh, I will start this talk by uh, presenting the context and the state of the art of the techniques. Then I will talk about the uh, Kelvin probe force microscopy, and then I will finish by uh, presenting the results. So let's start with the need of characterization. So uh, in order to push the detection limit of photodetectors, we need to decrease the so-called dark current, because the dark current can decrease the sensitivity of the pixel. And basically, dark current can be defined as a thermally generated current in the pixel under no illumination condition. So to understand this property, let's have a look at this graph. So basically here we have the valence band and the conduction bands of a semiconductor. And at room temperature, the generation of an electron hole sphere is highly unfavorable due to the amplitude of the band gap. But in real life, we can have some defects present within the band gap and these defects can assist the generation of an electron hole sphere. And basically the presence of, uh, I mean the high density of defect uh, present at at the interfaces are uh, responsible of uh, dark current. So at this point, you might have one question in your mind is, how do we decrease dark current? So basically to decrease dark current, there are two solutions. Here it's represented the interface between a semiconductor and uh, an oxide. And so we have the connection band, valence band, and the energy Fermi level. It's also represented the defect, which are mainly close uh, to the interface. And in order to respect some, I mean, charge neutrality between the oxide and the semiconductor, the conduction bands and the valence band are bent in the vicinity of the surface. 
So for, for silicon, the origin of the defects come from the presence of dangling bounds at the, at the interface. And so one way to decrease dark ruins is to decrease the density of defects. And so for silicon, uh, we, can, we can add some hydrogen in the process in order to fill this dangling bound and then uh, decrease the density of defect. Another way to decrease dark ruins is to put the interface under accumulations because the main active defects are close to the balance band. And so by putting the interface under accumulation, we can, uh, we can uh, neutralize this defect. And for p-type semi, uh, semiconductor, we will use a negative charge within the oxide in order to put the interface under accumulation. So to decrease dark ruins, we need now tools in, in order to be able to characterize the uh, interface. So one way uh, could be the use of the COCOS method. So basically COCOS means corona oxide characterization of semiconductor. And this technique is very relevant for the study of passivation layers because we can have access uh, to the field effect passivation and to the chemical passivation. For the field effect passivation, we can probe the surface barrier potential with LS if we are under accumulation or depletions. And we can also have access to the total amount of charges contained within the oxide. For chemical passivation, we can probe also with the COCOS method the uh, uh, density of defects present at the interface. So basically, uh, COCOS is an equivalent to a capacitance voltage measurement, and it has the advantage to be a contactless method. However, when we reach very high sensitive, I mean high uh, passivation quality, we are not longer able to um, to understand the dark current variation by just looking at the COCOS measurement. So that's why we need to develop a new method in order to increase the sensitivity of uh, embedded interfaces. So one way could be the use of carrier lifetime uh, because uh, this, uh, this parameter is well known from the literature to be uh, very high sensitive to low density of defects. But let's first define this uh, parameter with this example. So here we, we take the example of recombination process through uh, assisted by the defect. Uh, so basically, we have an electron in the connection band and hole in the valence band. And this electron hole pair can recombine through the defect by raising the uh, energy in the form of phonons. So we can define the carrier recombination lifetime by the times it takes for an electron hole pair to recombine. Experimentally speaking, we can probe this property uh, with different uh, uh, procedures, like photoconductance decay, photoluminescence decay, surface photovoltage, and so on. But in our case, since we study embedded interfaces, the surface photovoltage seems to be the more relevant parameter because this quantity is highly sensitive to the surface. So that's why we, we will use uh, carrier lifetime to probe, a probe by the mean of surface photovoltage, uh, which appear to be a good candidate to study embedded interfaces. So in that context, we will probe uh, so the carrier lifetime by the mean of surface photovoltage, and we will use uh, KPFM, uh, which is uh, basically an, atom, um, an electric mode of atomic force uh, microscopy. But I will come back to this notion later. So the, uh, you can find in the literature that the carrier lifetime probed by a KPFM can be sensitive to defect even when embedded in uh, silicon dioxide. And basically, this point is very important for us because we study embedded interfaces. And on top of that, the authors show a wide temporal, wide temporal resolution and an at nanometer scale with the KPFM technique. So at this, at this point, we have two questions in mind. And the first, is lifetime pro by KPFM sensitive enough to differentiate passivation layers? And second, do we have a defect only at the interface? Or in other words, do we have a depth distribution of the defects? So now let's talk about the Kelvin probe force microscopy. So KPFM. So what is KPFM? KPFM is a scanning probe method that allows us to, uh, pro to probe the contact potential difference between an AFM tip and a conductive or semiconductive sample. So basically, we will detect the electrostatic force, and then we will nullify this, this force by the mean of uh, a bias, I mean, a DC component. Because when this force is equal to zero, the DC component becomes equal to the contact potential difference. And you can find several modes of this technique depending on how you will modulate the force and how you will detect the force. So here are presented the main mode of uh, KPFM. So basically, so we have the frequency modulation KPFM. So in this mode, we will modulate 
uh, at, we will modulate the force at an arbitrary frequency, so let's call it FM, and then we will detect the frequency shift uh, at FM and then nullify this shift by the mean of the DC component. In amplitude modulation KPFM, we will modulate the force at either the first or second resonance of the cantilever and then detect and nullify this, uh, the uh, amplitude at F2 or F1. And finally, in heterodyne, it's a little bit different since we, here we modulate the force at F2 minus F1, but we will detect the force only at uh, F2. And then, uh, like before, uh, nullify the amplitude by the, with the DC component. And all these modes have um, their own advantages and disadvantages. And basically, frequency modulation is known to have a low potential sensitivity but high spatial resolution. Amplitude modulation uh, is known to have high potential sensitivity but low modulation, uh, low spatial resolution. And heterodyne have a high potential sensitivity and a high spatial resolution. So in our case, so like I said before, we study embedded interfaces. And as I will explain later, uh, to, for the carrier lifetime measurement, we will look at the change of surface potential of the embedded surface potential, which come from the interface. So uh, the, the presence of a uh, passivation layer, which is, which is mostly insulating, can be a limiting factor since it will screen these uh, changes. So that's why we need to implement, uh, that's why we will implement the heterodyne KPFM mode in order to have a high sensitive, high potential sensitivity for the study of uh, embedded interfaces. So here it's represented the implementation of heterodyne mode with a shape to a line module, module. So basically we use a photo, uh, photodial signal uh, of the AFM as an input. And then we send to the AFM tip uh, the VAC component at F2 minus F1, as I explained before. And to this AC component with some uh, and DC component to nullify the force. And finally, we will send to an external controller the uh, compensated DC component, which corresponds to the contact potential difference. So let's briefly have a look to the implementation with the Lab1 software. And so we, we will use the mod tab uh, of the Lab1 software to, to perform the, the modulation at F2 minus F1, as shown here. And we'll set an amplitude of the VAC component uh, low enough in order to avoid some artifacts with uh, the measurement. And finally, we'll sum this VAC component with a DAC component uh, and then send uh, both uh, bias to the, to the tip. And then we'll detect the electrostatic force by demodulating the photodiode signal at F2, as shown here. And this uh, demodulation will be then sent to the, uh, to the PA, PID um, controller in order to nullify the force uh, with the DC component. And finally, we'll use also a second demodulator in order to perform some phase adjustment and set the quadrature component of the locking uh, equal to zero. So here it's represented uh, our experimental setup. So basically we, use, we work with an Omicron atomic force microscopy under ultra high vacuum as shown here. And we will use an anonymous uh, lock-in for the non-contact atomic force microscopy and the HF2LI uh, lock-in for the KPFM. And basically we couldn't uh, implement the heterodyne mode with an anonymous because uh, with this lock-in we, we don't have the possibility to perform the modulation at F2 minus F1 and the demodulation at F2. So that's why we needed uh, the HF2LI module. And for the carrier lifetime measurement, we'll need some lasers. So here we, in our setup, we have four lasers and that we can modulate up to few megahertz for the carrier lifetime uh, measurement. So now let's talk about Kelvin probe force microscopy but under illumination. And before we talk about carrier lifetime, we need to define the, the surface photovoltage. So basically, under illuminations, we will generate electron hole pairs. And um, because of the space charge region, in the, uh, because of the space charge region, this electron hole pair will be then separate. And in this case, we have we have a downward band bending, which means the electron will diffuse towards the surface. And this diffusion will induce change in surface potential. And at this point, we can probe with a KPFM tip the, the surface potential under illumination. Then we switch off the light, the charge will recombine with uh, given dynamics, and the uh, surface potential will come back to its initial value. So at this point, we can also uh, probe the surface potential, so under dark condition. 
And with this two measurement, under uh, illumination and under dark condition, we can have access to the surface photovoltaic. And basically, this quantity corresponds to the reorganizations of charges under illumination. And it, it, this quantity is highly dependent and sensitive to the electronical and surface properties. So before we talk about uh, change of uh, surface potential under continuous illuminations, so now we talk about changes of surface potential under modulated illuminations. So here it's represented the modulation of the light, so at low modulation frequency and at high modulation frequency. And here it's the response of the photovoltaic. So under illumination, we generate charges. Uh, we generate charges, and under dark conditions, we will uh, these charges will the, uh, recombine, and uh, the, photo, the surface photovoltaic uh, will uh, decrease. But with the KPFM, we are not able to, to probe the entire dynamic of surface photovoltaic because this dynamic is way too fast with respect to the uh, KPFM integration times. So what we can do is to probe the average value of the surface photovoltaic represented by the blue line here. And at low modulation frequency, we'll have a given value of the average value of surface photovoltaic. But when we increase the, the modulation of the light, the, surf, the average value will increase also because under dark condition, we give less time to the electron hole pair to recombine. And in other words, under dark condition, we can cut off the exponential decay of the surface photovoltaic. So by, uh, take it, by measuring the average surface photovoltaic from low modulation to high modulation, we can uh, have, uh, uh, obtain a spectroscopic curve like this. And from this curve, we can uh, fit uh, using this model the data in order to obtain the, the um, carrier lifetime, the recombination carrier lifetime. So basically, we have two quantities, the surface photovoltaic, which gives information about carrier diffusion, and carrier lifetime, which gives information about uh, passivation quality. And we will use four wavelengths uh, in order to evaluate the influence of the penetration depth of the wavelengths uh, into uh, carrier lifetime and the uh, uh, surface photovoltaic. So let's briefly talk about the samples. So basically, we have four layers, four, four passivation layers, so silicon oxide, silicon nitride, aluminum oxide, aluminum oxide, and a B layer composed of aluminum oxide and tantalum oxide. And we work on P-type uh, silicon substrate. So now let's talk about the results. So on the left, we have the potential barrier probed by the COCOS uh, measurement for the four passivation layers. And as you can see, we, we, we mainly have two regimes. We can have a negative or positive uh, surface uh, barrier, which means that in this case, we have an upward band bending. And for the silicon nitride and silicon oxide, we have a downward band bending. And if we look at the surface photovoltaic, we can see also two uh, responses, I mean, two regimes. We can have a positive surface photovoltaic, which means that the hole will diffuse toward the surface and negative surface photovoltaic, which means that the electron will diffuse the surface. And on top of that, we can see that uh, we have a dependence of the amplitude of the surface photovoltaic uh, with respect to the wavelengths. And that phenomenon can be explained by the fact that with the proper light, we, we under strong illuminations, we will tend to flatten uh, the, the band bending only over uh, 100 nanometers, when with the red light, we tend to flatten the entire space charge region. But what we must note from this measurement is that the sample measurement of surface photovoltaic allows us to determine uh, the electronical property at the interface and tell us if we are under accumulation or under depletion. And this property is very important in the case of uh, passivation study. Now, if we compare the surface photovoltaic with the density of defect, so probe also by the COCOS measurement for the four passivation layers, we can see that uh, we have a small amplitude of surface photovoltaic when we have a high density of defect. And once density decreases, the amplitude of surface photovoltaic uh, increases. And that's also the case under uh, depletions. And this phenomenon can be explained that uh, under strong illumination, we will so we'll tend to flatten the band, so which means we'll decrease the effect of field defect passivations. So in that case, the density of defects becomes uh, uh, the main uh, limiting factor to the amplitude of uh, surface photovoltaic. Now let's talk about carrier lifetime. 
And um, so here we have the cocoa measurement, the density of defect and the potential barrier. And here the carrier lifetime probed by the heterodyne KPFM. So let's start with the depletion case. And so as you can see, silicon nitride and silicon dioxide have a relatively fast recombination process, even at low density of defect. And that can be explained by, uh, by the fact that we, uh, we are under depletion, which is the most, the, the most unfavorable case for uh, passivation. Now, if we look at the, the case of accumulation and start with uh, aspirin dioxide, we can see that we have a um, recombination process which is slower than uh, the, the depletion case. And that because we have a low density of defect and because we, have a, uh, um, we are under accumulation. So that's why we have a, a slower recombination process than before. But if we compare this uh, recombination process to aluminum oxide interface, we can see that uh, the process is faster than uh, for aluminum oxide. And that can be explained also by the fact that uh, because of the field effect passivations, in the sense that for the aluminum oxide, we have a relatively uh, poor uh, field effect passivation, which will lead to a, uh, a fast, uh, let's say, uh, recombination process. And for the aluminum oxide uh, interface, we can see that we have a good quality in terms of passivation because we have a slow recombination process and slower than uh, one millisecond at least. Um, but the most important uh, information is that um, if we look at the, only at the, uh, the glucose measurement, uh, I mean, only to the density of defect or the field defect passivation, it's, we cannot differentiate these two layers. But when we look at the uh, carrier lifetime uh, probed by KPFM, we can clearly differentiate all the passivation layer. So making uh, this technique with the carrier lifetime uh, method um, a, good, um, a good method for study uh, embedded interfaces and a highly sensitive method. So let's talk about the benefit. So here, it's uh, like before the carrier lifetime uh, for the five passive, uh, passivation layers. And ha as you can see, we can have a dependence on the amplitude of the lifetime with respect to the penetration depth uh, of, the, of the light. And this phenomenon can be explained by the fact that uh, the distribution of defect is not the same when we are close to the surface or uh, deeper in the materials. And we can explain this uh, observation by two hypotheses uh, that has been reported in the literature. So first, uh, because we, we have a, a P-type type silicon, we can expect some burn oxygen defects present within the bulk. And these defects can, um, can act as a recombination center that could explain why uh, when we go deeper in the material, we have a faster recombination process. And the second hypothesis could be the, the charge trapping effect because it has been reported mainly for aluminum oxide interface, some charge trapping effect. And this effect could slow down the mechanisms near the interface that, would, uh, that could explain this uh, be behavior. But on top of that, on top of this, uh, dynamic, we, we should add a second uh, mechanism. So let's talk about it. So here it's represented the contact potential difference. So under dark uh, conditions, under modulated light, so from low modulation to high modulation. And basically it's from that spectrum that, that we can extract the carrier lifetime, I mean, the one we, we discussed just before. And here we are under uh, continuous illumination. And as you can see, we can have a large difference between the, this maximum and the maximum under modulated light. And this difference is what we call the missing surface photovoltaic. And here, we, we, it's represented the missing surface photovoltaic over the four passivation layers. And as you can see, the response can be quite uh, different. So basically, for the aluminum oxide interface, we reach only 50%. We reach, I mean, under modulated light, we reach only 50% of the entire amplitude. When with the silicon nitride, we, re, we will re reach uh, mostly more or less the same amplitude than uh, under continuous light. And this uh, missing surface photovoltaic uh, can be explained by two uh, additional mechanisms, which could be either a fast recombination process or a slow recombination process. So, so uh, in the case of fast decay, uh, so basically, so here it's represented the response photovoltaic uh, at high modulation frequency. So under light, uh, we generate charges, so the surface photovoltaic will rise. And then under dark condition, it will uh, decay, 
with first a fast decay, and this fast decay would be responsible for of the missing surface photovoltaic, and this second uh, decay uh, can be associated to the carrier lifetime, uh, I mean, the one we discussed just before. And as you can see, the maximum amplitude or at high modulation frequency of the average value can be different from the, uh, the maximum amplitude. And that can explain uh, the missing surface photovoltaic. And the second um, dynamic could be a slow buildup in the sense that under illuminations, we can have a slow dynamic of generation, which would prevent to reach uh, the maximum value. And then explain also why we have a difference between uh, these two maximum, leading to the missing surface uh, photovoltaic. So basically, the missing surface photovoltaic can be explained by second dynamics, which can be either a slow buildup or a fast decay. And we must understand uh, this second dynamic because uh, depending, uh, this parameter seems to be very highly sensitive on the surface property. We can and, and highly depend on the, on the, on the electro electronical property uh, at the surface. So now let's conclude. So basically, we show that uh, this, uh, we could probe the surface photovoltaic even when embedded with uh, the heterodyne KPFM. And we could correlate the um, uh, surface photovoltaic with the barrier potential sign. And also with the density of defect by looking at the amplitude of the surface photovoltaic. And for the carrier lifetime, we could analyze the, um, carrier, the time scale by uh, the cocos analysis. But we could go one step further and um, easily differentiate all the passivation layer when it wasn't always the case with the, uh, the cocos measurement. And we show also that, for, especially for the silicon uh, aluminum oxide interface, we have uh, a, second, um, a second dynamic that we must consider in order to have a full representation of the dynamics that occur uh, at the interface. And finally, we show that we um, have a depth distribution of the defect, and that could be associated uh, to either uh, some bulk defect, defect or some trapping uh, effect. So at this point, we need to go, I mean, the next step is to now to determine if we have a fast recombination or slow uh, generation. And that can be done by using some simulations, as represented here, in order to evaluate which scenario is the most favorable. And then we will use uh, the pump probe uh, heterodyne KPFM approach in order to uh, experimentally uh, resolve the surface photovoltaic and determine if we have a fast recombination or slow generation. So I would like to thank my supervisor, but I would like also to thank Benjamin Graver because he helped uh, us a lot in the implementation of the heterodyne uh, uh, KPFM and also of the pump probe, pump probe um, KPFM. So thank you for your attention. Valentin, many thanks for this interesting presentation. Questions from the audience are already waiting for you, and I can tell you there is quite a few. So let's start with, with a question from Meng. How did you determine the sensitivity of various KPFM methods, like below 50 millivolts or 5 millivolts? Yes, uh, basically you can determine, determine it uh, from the uh, analyt anal analytical point of view, I would say. But experimentally speaking, you can uh, easily see the difference between, uh, I mean, FM mode and heterodyne mode by just looking at the noise. And you can see that with the heterodyne mode, we have a, a noise which is more or less about five millivolts. Okay, great, thank you. Next question from Jana. Since VAC modulation is faster for heterodyne KPFM compared to FM KPFM, can you also have a faster feedback loop for Kelvin probe? Um, uh, what we must um, know uh, for first is that in both cases, we will probe the average value of the, of the signal. So in both cases, it won't influence, influence it, the, um, the measurement. So, but for the um, feedback, feedback loop, uh, I didn't compare, so I cannot uh, answer. Um, it will obviously depend on the frequency. Of the of the of the mode of the modulation, but I don't I, I didn't compare the, the the feedback loop parameter between these two modes, so I, I don't want to make some mistakes. So yeah. 
Okay, maybe there is something to do after we all come back to the labs. Thank yes. you for the answer. <laughs> Next question is from Bjorn. It's, um, so he's asking about a single photon event or is it a pixel illuminated by a collimated light at a given power? Yeah, actually we, we, we set the power of the, of the laser in order to have a constant flux over the, over the visible range. And it's not, I mean, we, we directly send the, um, the laser through, um, uh, directly on the sample. There is nothing, uh, no optical uh, stuff between the laser and the, um, and the, and the sample. Cool, okay. Thanks. And we have another question uh, from Lucas. What are the band gaps of all these samples at different doping levels? And how do they compare to the AC voltage of the KPFM feedback loop? Uh, I, I mean, we didn't share, we, we, we use only one um, I mean the, uh, semiconductor with the same doping level. So we didn't uh, work with, uh, we didn't dope the, um, uh, we didn't, I mean, didn't share the doping level, so I don't quite understand the question. Uh, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. That's okay. Uh, we can uh, come back to this question later and maybe yeah. Uh, yeah. clarify uh, what was meant, but yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. Thank you for okay. the input. And do we have another one? Yes. Is it possible to perform experiment in ambient condition? Um, I would say that yes, but the main advantage to perform such measurement under um, ultra high vacuum is that we can have mainly for KPFM measurement, uh, high quality factor, so which means we will we can work with a low um, uh, low bias for the VAC component, for example, and then uh, limit some artifacts. And in our case, we are not limited by the um, contamination purpose because we have a passivation layer. But for measurement with uh, highly reactive surface, it's also more uh, preferable to perform such measurement under a high vacuum in order to have more stability of the surface. Okay, so in a way, it would be a totally different experiment focusing yes, yes, totally. on different um, aspects. Uh, thank you very much for explaining this. And unfortunately, this was the last question that we could answer here and now. But we will not left any question unanswered. Our expert will help you to the best of their knowledge. We are going to provide you all with an extensive summary of the Q&A session in the email that you will receive a couple of days after the event. Thank you very much, Valentin, for your talk, and I would like to invite our audience for a five-minute break. Please take this chance to watch our Measurement Impossible video, written and filmed entirely by some of my Zurich Instruments colleagues. Enjoy the break! The signal is there. If only we could boost it.
ready to go. Ready to take off. Such a great production based on a true story. Also, Tom Cruise should start packing his bags. We are doing real science here. All right, let's continue our afternoon session with the second part, the tutorial. Our application scientist, Mehdi Alem, will show you how to set up an electrical pump probe experiment using an arbitrary waveform generator and a lock-in amplifier integrated into a single instrument. Let me quickly remind you about the Q&A session that we're gonna hold after the tutorial. Please submit your questions to the ask a question tab in the bottom of your Zoom window. Now over to Mehdi, it's your turn. Thank you very much, Magdanello, for this kind introduction and welcome everybody to this tutorial session. I would like to thank Valentin for his interesting talk on KPFM and let's just start where he actually finished his talk, which was actually a pump probe approach for KPFM system. So I would uh, go through quickly through microscopy, especially optical and scanning microscopy. Then we take a look at time resolve technique. First in the optical pump probe system, which was an inspiration for electrical pump probe system as well. And then we look at the requirements for, for electrical pump probe system and the measurement tools, which is mostly orbital waveform generators and locking amplifiers together. And then we go through a, in the practical session using a, one of our instruments and we go through a kind of uh, how to implement a pump probe KPFM system using our uh, Zurich Instruments devices. So let's start with microscopy. Actually, historically, microscopy has started with in an optical domain because light is visible. And with that, you can ac um, acquire the entire surface of a sample with quite fast. Uh, and that's the advantage of optical microscopy, but the, it suffers from the low spatial resolution. And the reason is that 
for far field light, you have you are limited by the diffraction phenomena, and it provides the resolution of uh, uh, in the range of uh, light wavelength, which is one micrometer. So if you would like to go to atomic scale, sub nanometer scale, uh, you cannot use simply optical microscopy, and you need to improve the resolution by three to four orders of magnitude. So that's the reason that people use a scanning probe microscopy. And the price that they pay is that they cannot have a fast acquisition of the entire sample. They need to scan the, the sample and go pixel by pixel. But the benefit is that you can get really atomic and sub nanometer scale resolution. And depending on the type of scanning probe microscopy or type of the quantity of physical quantity that you measure with a scanning probe microscopy, you can have different types of microscopy. If you combine scanning probe with optical microscopy and using the near field light, you are no longer limited by the diffraction of light. And then you can have scanning near field microscopy, which is called SNOM. Or, and uh, if you measure the, the quantum tunneling effect and the flow of uh, electrons from the uh, from the probe to the surface, then you ha can have scanning tunneling microscopy or STM, which provides really high spatial resolution. If you measure the force between the probe and the surface, then you have atomic force microscopy. And since there are different types of force between the sample and the probe, depending on the type of potential difference uh, or potential energy stored in between, you can have uh, piezoelectric force, magnetic force, electrostatic force, Van der Waals force, and these are different flavors of atomic force microscopy. Here on the right, you see a, the basic setup for an AFM system. You have a position, a, a scanner actually that changes the X and Y position of a sample, and you see the surface of a sample. You have a cantilever with a sharp tip at the end, and this tip actually uh, moves up and down depending on the type of force that, uh, or the amount of force that the, the, it uh, it actually experiences based on the sample and uh, tip interaction. And then yeah, there is the disp displacement or deflection measurement system, which is usually a laser and a photodiode system, that you can see how what how much is the height of this. Uh, cantilever. And then with that, you can measure the topography of your surface. That's the base of the, the AFM system. Now let's look at the time resolved uh, technique, actually. So this, uh, you know, with, with uh, scanning microscopy, you provide high spatial resolution, but usually your sample or yours is static or in a steady state. But what happens if you would like to see the dynamic of your sample or if this, the, the surface is evolving in time or you would like to see that the uh, transient absorption or the emission of a, a sample. So with that, or when in, in such a situation that you have a dynamic, there is a technique called time resolved. And with that, you can actually uh, measure the temporal evolution of your sample. First, you need to excite your sample with a rather strong pump pulse that uh, provides energy for the sample to bring it up from its uh, peaceful ground state to a, an agile, actually excited state. And then after that, the sample would like to get back to its uh, uh, ground state. and during this transition, you can send a propulse and measure at a specific time the state of your system or your sample. And by changing this delay between the pump and the probe, you can obtain this uh, temporal evolution of the sample. So with that, you need a pump pulse to excite the sample, a propulse to uh, measure the sample. And usually the resolution of the, or the temporal resolution is determined by the pulse width, especially the probe uh, pulse width. And uh, also the, the resolution of the delay that you can provide between the pump and the probe. 
This technique historically started with the, in photonics application or in optical measurement because there are mode lock laser that can provide really uh, short pulses in the range of femtosecond. And also you can tune the delay between the pulses by uh, the time of propagation uh, using linear stages and they can provide uh, sub micrometer resolution, which means in the range of femtosecond resolution for the delay. So that's the time resolve technique for improving the temporal resolution. And if we look at one of the typical setup of optical palm probe or time resolve technique that you see here in this inset image, you have a palm pulse, you excite the sample, and after a delay, you send the probe and you measure the state of your sample. The setup would be two pump and probe pulses uh, interacting with the sample here, and then you measure the probe, and the delay can be here adjusted by just changing the, uh, the propagation time by uh, changing the, the location of the linear stage. You can also see here a modulation, which is usually done with a chopper in, in laser systems. And this modulation helps you to, to distinguish the signal after the measurement uh, from all other undesired components and noise that you have. And this is where you usually use a locking amplifier where you modulate and demodulate at a certain frequency. You can actually combine this technique with your a AFM. So if you have an AFM system and you have a sample that is photosensitive, like a gallium arsenide photodiode or such things, then you can combine AFM for, to have high spatial resolution and optical palm probe to have high temporal resolution. You see here a typical a standard AFM system and also a palm probe system to to, and then they are somehow synchronized and linked together. And you can use locking amplifiers or sometimes boxcar averaging depending on the width of the pulse that you have. And what you finally measure is actually the photocarrier decay or excitation of this, uh, of the sample when you shine light on that. And that would be uh, the, the final result that you have a tiny sample and you can also measure very fast the the when when it is uh, under uh, illumination by by short pulses so that's uh, afm with optical pump probe what what happens when your sample is not photosensitive and like in some uh, systems that the sample can be actually excited by electrical signal and electrical field in that case, you can use an electrical pump probe approach uh, and for which instead of using two laser pulses, you need to use uh, electrical pulses that can be generated by pulse generators or even better by arbitrary waveform generators to have uh, arbitrary pulse shape. Then the pulse, the delay between the pulses should be adjustable and can be sweeped so that you can measure for a different um, time. Um, the, you can measure this uh, the, the temporal evolution for different time. And also you should be able to modulate your palm or probe or both. If I get back again here, you see that there is a modulation here, which is usually done on the by chopper, but in electrical systems, you need to be able to modulate it electrically. So that's also a, a quite important feature to be able to modulate the signal so that the, later you can demodulate and get your signal. You may also need to synchronize the modulation frequency with the repetition rate of your pulse strains. So that would be the requirement for generation power. For the measurement part, of course, what you need is demodulation. First, you need to lock to the frequency of the modulation provided by the AWG, and then you should be able to do dual phase demodulation to get the full information of the 
of the signal, both amplitude and phase, or in phase and quadrature components. You need also a sweeper tool so that it can control both generation, signal generation and signal detection and sweeps the delay between the, the two pulse trains and for each sweep point measures the, the desired signal. So here, for example, I have one instrument, the UHF LI locking amplifier that provides both generation and detection part because it has an AWG as an option. And also it's software, it's control software, Lab1, provides many tools, including sweeper to orchestrate the whole measurement, including signal generation and signal detection. Let's quickly look at the, the AWG part of the instruments. So it has uh, a sequencer that you can uh, write a simple program to define the waveform that you would like to generate, how many uh, waveforms in how many channels and so on. And also the timing between these two, how to sweep delays and these uh, parameters. And then the final would be the waveform that you generate. So, and with that, actually, since the AWG generates a waveform sample by sample, which means you define all the sample val uh, values, you can really uh, generate any arbitrary waveforms with all types of modulation, including amplitude, phase, and frequency modulation. So that's the AWG uh, part, but this AWG also has a very important feature, which is uh, crucial for this specific application that you can modulate the, the waveform that you generated with a sign signal. It means that you have a waveform here, uh, like a Gaussian waveform here, and then you can multiply it by a sinusoidal signal. In the frequency domain, it means that the baseband signal that is uh, shown here with green is transferred to a, a bandpass region and uh, this is actually crucial when we want to measure with the lock-in detection. So that's the feature that is required for uh, this application and is provided with the AWG option of the instrument. The benefit of this feature actually is that you save a lot of memory on the AWG, but what is crucial for this application is that independent from other parameters, you can sweep some other parameters actually. So for, for instance, here, independent from the pulse shape and width, you can sweep the frequency. Or here, independent from the frequency of the modulation, you can sweep the duty cycle, you can sweep the delay between pulses, you can sweep the, the pulse width and so on. And that's uh, what we are going to use for this technique. For the measurement part, we use a locking amplifier, and you know better than me that what a locking amplifier is. You the, the locking amplifier, if you look at it as a black box, is simply a dual phase demodulator. It receives a signal at a certain frequency with an amplitude and phase, and it provides you the amplitude and phase of that signal at the cost of knowing its frequency. So you should tell the device, that's my frequency, and then it tells you this is your amplitude and phase. That's a locking amplifier. And why it is important in these systems? Because you can really go extremely low noise. And since you are dealing with atomic scale signals, you are, your signals are really weak and are immersed in, a, in an ocean of noise. So you cannot do any other instruments except locking amplifiers to measure that. And that's thanks to its low pass filter that can reject all the no noise in the, in the signal. The other tool that you need is a sweeper to sweep a parameter in our case, the delay between the pulses, but it can sweep many other parameters here. We are sweeping frequency and we measure the amplitude and phase. So these are the two tools for the measurement part that we need. So now let's uh, look at one of the typical examples of the pump, electrical pump probe KPFM system here. So here, first you have a standard KPFM system. You see the, 
the AFM part, you see also the KPFM part. We have the, a PLL to follow the resonance frequency and so on. So that provides high spatial resolution. Now there is also a pump probe, electrical pump probe techniques here that for which you apply a pump a pulse to the sample in here in the, on this substrate and also a propulse on the on a conductive um, cantilever and the interaction between these two uh, these two put, uh, contact potential difference that you have here through a nonlinear effect induces a, a force on the cantilever and this force induces a displacement and this displacement is measured here so you can see here that uh, uh, we have an, an here it, the sample is an, uh, a field effect transistor an organic field effect transistor and we would like finally to measure the the transient state of the sample on the for example switching effect and see what happens when you switch the the voltage that is applied to this uh, transistor so here there is a pump pulse with 50 percent duty cycle and a period of 20 microsecond and also you have a propulse with a very low duty cycle usually which is also modulated with in this case 50 kilohertz so that's also one uh, important aspect that we needed actually so this uh, the, through the interaction the signal that you finally measure you have a component at the resonance frequency of the cantilever and also sideband components at the, the frequency of the modulation of the probe. And this is the final signal that we are going to measure. Here, the technique of the demodulation is a cascaded or tandem demodulation. So you measure first at the, uh, carrier frequency, and then you measure at the sideband frequency. But I will later show you that you can directly also measure at the sideband frequency and there is a kind of limitation here that the this uh, the first locking should have a huge bandwidth to cover the the modulation frequency which is in this case 50 kilohertz and then there will be a lot of noise passing through here but at the end you you can measure this uh, transient at the microsecond scale as you can see here so that's a typical uh, KPFM with pump probe, electrical pump probe approach. So let's look at the type of the signal that we would like to generate. The blue one is the, the pump signal with 50% duty cycle. And the green one is the, the probe signal. And you can see the sweeping of the delay between the pump and probe. And if you look at it at the bigger picture, you see also a modulation on top of the the probe signal. That's the signals that we would like to apply to the sample. So now let's uh, uh, switch to, to our uh, uh, instrument, the UHF LI locking amplifier with its AWG. And then I will show you how to generate such pulses and how to do a measurement. So here you see actually the web-based user interface of the instrument. Uh, you have different tools here for settings and measurement of the device, but the main tool that I'm going to use is first locking amplifier that controls the two input channels of the device, oscillators for signal generation, demodulators or locking detections, and also the two signal outputs of the device. The other tool is the oscilloscope that you can see both uh, uh, input channels to see the signals that we are generating and we, we are receiving. And I would like also to add the AWG option here to actually generate a, a signal here. So here you see there is a bunch of code here that we can uh, uh, I, I've already written this code, but you can have any, uh, you can write your own code and generate a type of signal that you would like. So 
in this case, let me use the, the code that I prepared actually for this uh, tutorial. And this is simply just pump and pro pulse generation. And then I would compile this code. It will be uploaded to the device. And then if I run this code, it generates a signal. I need to also run the, the oscilloscope. And this is the type of signal that we receive. Let's also trigger this signal. And you can see here the pump and probe together. So the probe actually sweeps the entire period of the pump and then stops for some time and then again it starts again. So you can uh, change all these parameters easily here. So let me, for, for instance, if you would like to have higher resolution in the time domain, you need to decrease the width of the pulse. So let me decrease the, the pulse width by 10 times. So then in that case, you will see that the now the pro pulse is much shorter and then it provides a better resolution. You may also want to change the speed of the, the sweep. So you can simply change it with some parameters here. It means that how many, how fast you would like to measure and how many averaging you would like to have and what's the trade-off between the signal to noise ratio and the, and the measurement that you, or the time of measurement that you have. So this is now a fast sweeping. Uh, sometimes you, so let me get back to some slower sweeping. Sometimes you would like to apply both um, uh, probe and pump together on one output channel and not uh, separately one on substrate and the other one on the, on the cantilever. So both of them at the same level. So in that case, we can simply add these uh, two waveforms on, on different, on, on the same channel here. So just by changing or tweaking some of these parameters, then in that case, you will see that now the pump and probe are on top of each other and they are on one output channel going to the to, to one port or exa exactly on the sample. So that's uh, the, the pulse generations. We would like also to have modulation on that. So let me again get back to a separate pump and probe and apply modulation on the on pump or probe or both actually. So with, now you see the pump and probe are separated together. So we can now simply apply a modulation on the probe. And you can see with this modulation feature that we have, let me a bit zoom out and see the signal better. So now you see the, the modulation on top of the probe. Sometimes, you would like to, so let's also trigger with the, with the modulation frequency in that case. So then we can see a fixed modulation while the, the probes are moving with, with respect to the pump. Sometimes it's possible also to have a modulation on top of the pump as well at different frequencies. And then you can measure at the frequency difference of these two modulation. And this is a typical approach that is used in optical pump probe systems that they measure at, uh, they apply F1 and F2 and they measure at F1 minus F2 or F1 plus F2 or any linear combination depending on the type of nonlinearity if, if they have. So, but in this case, let's get back to just uh, modulation or on the probe and we'll keep the pump actually plain as it is, and we trigger it with the AWG signal. So now let's, uh, uh, so that's the generation part. So now what, what do we want to measure? So at, ideally you need to measure at the resonance frequency of your cantilever, but I don't have a cantilever here to apply these things. And, um, but what I can do is to lock to the, to the pump and measure the probe with respect to the pump. So 
let me just change this the whole settings here uh, with uh, something that I've already prepared for this tutorial actually so that would be my right here so I will load the settings of the device and also the user interface that's quite a nice tool to save the settings so that next time that you have the you turn on the instrument you can quickly go to your uh, uh, correct settings and measurement so here i have a sweeper tool that i can sweep a parameter in this case it will be actually the the delay between the pulses i have again the the oscilloscope and the awg here with the the same uh, sequence uh, that I had before. So this time the, the sweeper actually is responsible to do the, the AWG part to generation and also to do the locking part and the, me the measurement. So if I simply start a sweep, you will see that there is a signal, a pump is generated. So let me a bit zoom in to see the signal and as the delay is swept between the pump and the probe we measure the phase difference between the pump and the probe so the locking actually locks to the pump and then it measures the, the probe so let me open the locking section that you can see so and again run the sweeper for one time more so this time the locking locks to this pump signal and uh, it measures the, the probe signal and this I only look at the phase of the signal. So that's why you see this phase here sweeping from the whole entire uh, cycle of 360 degree. Uh, you see also a phase unwrap here, uh, wrapping here that we can even remove it with phase unwrapping feature that we have here. So this time you don't see the, uh, the phase wrapping. So that's uh, without modulation so far. So now suppose that we have also a modulation on the, on the pro. If I apply the modulation and start the measurement, you would see that there won't be actually a proper signal. And the reason is that you, you see that now this is just random signal and you see the modulation here now. And we only have a random phase because we are not measuring at the right frequency. So to see that we can look at this spectrum uh, analyzer that we have, I just run it and look at the, the signal once it's generated, you will see that at the frequency of 50, like here at the frequency of 50 kilohertz away from the main signal, there are actually two sidebands, this one and this one. And this is due to the modulation and we need to measure exactly at these two frequencies. So for that, in the presentation, I showed you that one way is to do two locking measurements. So first at the base, uh, at the central frequency or the carrier frequency, and then at the sideband. But we have a very nice feature or option for the instrument, which is actually a modulation option that can measure at any linear combination of the carrier and sideband. So in this case, I just need to turn on this and if I again run the sweeper it now measures at the resonance frequency plus 50 kilohertz and minus 50 kilohertz and you can see both sidebands and the phase of both sidebands in this case which has a negative uh, value actually in uh, compared to each other so that would be the the proper measurement with the uh, modulation on the probe and the 
and uh, the phase measurement with, with this lock-in amplifier. But in reality, you may measure amplitude or other signals, but in this case, I just wanted to show how this delay is translated to the phase, and I use the phase measurement of the lock-in. So now let me get back to the presentation and, uh, and just in conclusion, well, show the, uh, just explain that uh, the AFM as a kind of SPM system provides high spatial resolution, but for to have temporal resolution, we need to use the time resolve technique, which can be an um, optical, uh, pump probe system, which provides really picosecond or sub-picosecond resolution or electrical pump probe system that can go down to nanosecond resolution. Uh, and when you combine these two together, you can have both temporal and uh, spatial resolution at a very good level. And the instrumentations that, uh, that are required is uh, AWG and locking amplifiers somehow synchronized together. With that, I would like to um, thank you for your attention. Many thanks for this insightful tutorial, Mehdi. And we can now start the Q&A session. I'm just waiting a second for our technical team in the backstage to display them for me so I can represent you in front of Mehdi. We have a first one from Michael. What is the temporal resolution of electrical pump probe in this example? In the specific examples that I shown you from the, that uh, paper was in the range of uh, one or two microsecond because the propulse was at that range and that was uh, one that was required by the type of the sample. But depending on the sampling rate of the AWG, you can go down to nanosecond resolution. Thank you. Do we have another one? This time again from a mysterious scientist who wants to know how is the side by demodulation done in this setup? Yeah, so in the presentation, uh, I briefly explained that the sideband demodulation was done by the, by the cascaded or tandem demodulation. So first they demodulate at the resonance frequency, which is the carrier frequency. And then the result will be demodulated by, by the sideband frequency. There is another technique that you can directly demodulate at the sideband frequencies uh, using this modulation option that I explained in the practical part of the, in the tutorial. Seems like locking amplifiers have no secrets for you, Mehdi. So, um, next question from Asim. How do you deal with signal distortion if you have some impedance mismatch, for instance? Well, that depends on at which frequency level we, we have and also uh, the, the transient of the pulses. So in case the, the pulses are sharp, like the situation that I showed you in the tutorial, then it means that the pulses have high frequency contents and then the impedance mi mismatch would be important. And one solution is to smooth the pulse by using some other type of pulses, and that's why arbitrary waveform generator can be useful. The other way is to try to actually uh, match the, the impedance of the systems by some impedance matching uh, network or circuits. Great, thank you very much. We still have some time for more questions, so let's go. Um, Lucas wants to know if he can use the AWG for modulation and delay, both as the master and as a slave for pump probe measurements. 
And additionally, what are the limits in frequencies from megahertz to gigahertz? Uh, yes, it can be used as master or slave it, because as a master, it, it modulates the, the pump and probe signal with its uh, internal oscillator. But if you have actually an external um, uh, uh, frequency for modulation, you can use the external reference and then it can apply th that frequency to the, to the generated pulse. So that can be done as a master and both a slave. Uh, the limits in the frequency is the, the limitation of the frequency range of the device, which is from DC to 600 megahertz. So that, that's uh, both for as a master and as a slave. So up to 600 megahertz, you can do uh, the, the modulation. Thank you very much, Mehdi, for this extensive answer. I think we still have time for the last one uh, from Robbie. Uh, the web-based user interface that we saw. Is the oscilloscope a real measurement or an experimental setup? Is it a real measurement on internal electronics or is it a simulation? It's a real measurement. It's a real-time measurement. You are really receiving, I mean, I'm generating a signal with the device and I'm measuring the signal with the device. And uh, there is an oscilloscope module on the software that has party on the device, which acquires the signal fast with the sampling rate of 1.8 gigasample per second. And then it is sent to the computer shot by shot to provide the, the signal visually for the user. As I said before, Mehdi, lock-ins have no secrets for you. And I know that you will be happy to share your knowledge with our audience. And at this time, at this point, I have to tell you sadly again that that was the last question in this live Q&A session. However, the questions that we already um, received from you will be answered by Mehdi and our colleagues. And we're gonna share with you the summary in the email that you're gonna receive within 10 days, including as well the recording of the session. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mehdi. And with this, um, I would like to close the whole SPM, virtual SPM user meeting. On the behalf of the user meeting team, I would like to thank our speakers for their great contributions and thank everyone for their active participation. It has been a great pleasure for me to be your host. Let's keep in touch. We are always thrilled to hear about your instrumentation challenges. And everyone in the user meeting team has been very excited to organize this virtual form of our annual SPM gathering. We would like to thank you again for joining us virtually and see you in Lyon in a year from now. <laughs>